So this is one of the most interesting conversations I've had all year, and it's with former poker pro and scientist Liv Barry. So Liv has a YouTube channel where she makes films about game theory, complexity, physics, a lot of other really interesting topics, and we covered a lot of ground in this conversation, including what she learned about intuition and logic playing poker. Everyone in the world tells you, oh no, trust your gut. When it's got a really strong feeling, it knows. It knows something that you don't. And it's like, well, this is clearly not true because it's often wrong. Um, there's, there's bias, and, and it's, it seems to be largely, by and large, you know, am I having a good day or a bad day? If I'm having a good day, my, my intuitions tend to, to be more optimistic. If I'm having a bad day, my intuition is pessimistic. So I can't trust it that much. We also talked about game theory and why it's such a useful tool for sense making. It's just the mathematics of these competitive situations, effectively, um, looking, looking to see what optimal strategies are, suboptimal strategies, um, and the phenomena that arise out of them. And we delved into a concept popularized by Scott Alexander called Moloch, which took the conversation in a really interesting direction. And what he really did for the first time was he, he related Moloch to game theory and talked about how it seems to be this sort of the force. So again, if there's this force of something that's driving the you know, emergence and complexity, there seems to be this opposing force, which is a, a force of destruction that sort of uses competition for ill. Moloch is the god of, of health, unhealthy competition, of negative sum games. So, competitive interactions that make the world worse off for their existence as opposed to being neutral or better. Liv is also one of the speakers at our free State of Sense Making event on the 25th and 26th of September. So you can sign up for that down in the show notes and I hope you enjoy the film. So Liv, welcome to Rebel Wisdom. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. So you're a former pro poker player and you also have an interest in game theory, which is something that we've uh, covered on the channel and, and something we're always um, wanting to learn a little bit more about. But the first question I wanted to ask you is, can we play our way out of all the sort of game theory traps we find ourselves in, by which I mean um, the broken information landscape, institutional corruption, the culture wars, polarization, obviously the list goes on, or are we just completely fucked? Uh, I mean, that's the quadrillion dollar question, right? Um, <laughs> the, I certainly don't know the answer to that. Um, I sincerely hope that there is a way out of it. Um, I don't see what it is, in all honesty. It's something that consumes my thoughts on pretty much a daily basis. Um, but there's something in me, call it dumb optimism, call it the belief, you know, if there's these sort of dangerous forces of sort of semi-entropic forces trying to break down complexity, the complexity that is civilization uh, in one direction, it almost seems like there's some kind of force pro-complexity trying to hold everything together and, and, and uh, keep, keep this weird world that we're in going, um, keeping things interesting. So. Uh, I, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know, I don't know what the answer is. All I know is that we are in an unbelievably critical time, um, you know, of the, pa the past decade and certainly the, the coming decade. Um, uh, it's, it's definitely, we're definitely in the most interesting time in human history. Um, okay, sure, I might be biased, being, seeing as I'm here and we like to be the, you know, the, the, the kings of our own stories. But uh, it's, yeah, it, shit's getting real. Which leads me to a question I wanted to ask you about, you know, a lot of the people we've had on the channel, like um, Daniel Spachtenberger or, or Jamie Wheel or Jordan Hall, who've talked about existential risk in particular, seem to be quite pessimistic. And then there's, a, there's other people who have a kind of, there's a meme called doomer <coughs> optimism, where, where there's a sense of, yes, we're screwed, but within that, we have some kind of hope and a kind of optimism in spite of that. And then you have people like, there's lots of different sort of tribes like extinction so um deep adaptation which is a big influence on for example extinction rebellion which is this sort of environmental version of we're all screwed it's already done um we need to go live in cabins and we need to be it's all for, i think it has kind of a religious quality to it almost um yeah i'm curious about how optimistic or pessimistic you are about the current state of affairs uh, depends what day you're asking me <laughs> <laughs> Right now, I'm in a more pessimistic mood simply because I read this article by uh, uh, Kai-Fu Lee yesterday 
um, talking about the the next generation of warfare that we're entering into with these, um, you know, with autonomous weapons and particularly AI-driven ones. Um, it's not inconceivable within a few years that for a thousand dollars you can. And, and a little bit of know-how basically build an, an entirely anonymous drone that can take out whoever you want and it will not be able to be traced back to you. Um, and that's, you know, that's just the, the you know, the, the beginning. Um, and like you read that and you're just like, I don't see how we will ever make it. So right now I'm in a pessimistic mood, but after the weekend, I did like a little Burning Man ceremony and just felt the magic a little bit. And I was like, no, we're going to make it, you know? And it's weird. It's like a, <clears throat> I mean, you could almost say, is it like a sort of left brain, right brain thing? You know, logically, I don't see a way out of it, but there's like some intuition in me that feels like we're going to make it. But then sometimes my intuitions are just like, no, like also how, like I don't see a solution. Um, so I don't, I don't know. Um, and I guess perhaps, perhaps the thing to do in the, in the face of that, you know, this constant uncertainty and, and this oscillation um, between the two extremes is to, you know, which, which, which state of mind would I rather live in more? Given that I don't know which one's the right one and I seem to be able to go into both, I might as well invest in what I can in myself to control that you know what am, am I more likely to wake up in an optimistic mood or a pessimistic mood and I can control that to an extent by by you know taking care of my information diet what do I read how much time do I spend on Twitter um you know definitely the pessimism is correlated to the amount you know my what my my phone tells me I've been looking at Twitter you know how many minutes per day you know part of the thing I hate about um you know you go onto Netflix or whatever right now it, it's just the, the, the amount of dystopian art out there to utopian art is like 100 to 1. Probably worse even. There's just, there's just so little um, utopian programming, films, books. Um, and, and part of the reason, I think, is because it's just much easier to imagine a dystopia. You know, the, one of the reasons why utopia doesn't exist is because you know, it, it's incredibly hard to build. Um, so... Again, if you have a more optimistic society, then it gives people the space to dream up and think of more positive things, and it's, it gets the ball rolling in the right direction. Yeah, I like that. There's, there's a bunch of stuff in there I'd love to pick up on. Um, the, the choice to be optimistic, you know, I think that is a very interesting thing in the times we live in. And it doesn't surprise me that, it's actually something I've written about before, the fascination we have with dystopia, mm -hmm. I think is in, I think there's lots of reasons for it, but I think in part, I, I've described it as, I've described the world we're living in sort of culturally as like a noir story, like a noir detective story, where you have the detective going through the, often like encountering different institutions, like the church, and okay, it turns out the priest is in on it and corrupt, and, and like corrupt to the core, and then the judges are corrupt, and the police are corrupt, and everyone's corrupt except for the detective usually and it plays this kind of um, chival chivalric role of, of the kind of broken but all like roughly all together pure of soul, pure of soul somewhere yes. in there right and yeah. they're like but light they're, in the dark yes light in the darkness but they're sort of like hitting the whiskey because like just to be the light in the darkness is, is so much and I think I think there's something in that as a kind of um, as an image and there are and also just kind of, you know, it, we're recording this not long after the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Um, and the, the sheer shaking, foundational shaking impact of things like 9-11 and the financial crash and um, many other things that have happened since then in terms of institutional trust. I think we, we have this sense of uh, being in or moving towards a dystopia. Um, but I'm very interested as well, you know, something you were just talking about in the, the optimism within that, right? The, the kind of, and even so, there is this kind of, sh the, there is this hope. So I wanted to talk a little bit about game theory because this kind of points towards a critique I have of game theory, but I thought it'd be cool to, um, to just kind of get a bit of a definition of, of what game theory is um, before, in case anyone's not really familiar with it. All game theory is, is a branch of economics, basically, um, which typically deals with competitive systems and it looks at the 
strategic, you know, it, it, it describes people or, or decision makers within it as agents, typically, just so that it's not human centric, you know, AIs could be uh, decision makers or whatever, um, mice, rats, and so on. Um, and it's just the mathematics of these competitive situations, effectively, um, looking, looking to see what optimal strategies are, suboptimal strategies, um, and the phenomena that arise out of them. You have an interesting position in this because you're a former pro poker player. And so, you know, one could argue, maybe this is wrong, correct me if it is, that you were sort of having to apply game theory under tremendous pressure with high stakes. But I'm curious about on the table, uh, how much of that is game theory and how much of it is um, obviously experience and then uh, intuition, which is another thing I'd love to talk about. But, you know, the critique of game theory is often just like with, with modern economics is that it relies on, on actors being... Uh, rational. I know not all game theory does, but this idea of rational actors looking after their self-interest, you know, it turns out we're not really rational actors, but I still think it has a lot of value. How applicable was it to, to your poker career? So, I think we need to step back a bit in terms of like describing what's going on at the poker table. So you will have obviously seven or eight other people around the table and your job is to basically sift through all the different f forms of information that you're receiving in order to figure out what the optimal decision is. And you've got multiple decision points. And there's a broad range of information that you're receiving, like from you know, the, the, the amount that the person bets, um, the, the cards that you have relating to the cards on the, board, on the table, um, the, the the demeanor of the, of the person, you know, like the, you know the, about their past experience, how much they've played, but then now their face is doing something funny that you've never noticed before, or they're breathing heavier, or something like that, something they say. Um, so there's this, there's a lot of qualitative and quantitative information coming in. And where game theory comes in really, like in, in this, in, in the case of poker, typically game theory applies to the strictly quantitative stuff. So, you know, the, there, there will be certain probabilities with which other cards will come out, um, and you you know the, the sort of odds that the that are being offered to you based upon your bet and so on. And what that means, based upon that information, effectively in a vacuum, the ma the, quantif the quantifiable information is that there will be these mathematically optimal solutions to to these different situations, um, which are because there's so many possible situations, they're very hard to calculate. It doesn't. It sounds like oh, so you just need to remember the math. No, um, but what game theory will do is basically suggest that there are certain strategies um, that you will want to employ in certain situations based upon this quantified information. But then, of course, there's this, this like nebula of other stuff coming in, like, well, yeah, but they were breathing funny, which they weren't doing before. How do you quantify that? And so on. Um, and in terms of how much of that nebula sort of applies to your overall decision making, I, I hate to, to put, like, try and put a percentage on it, but it's by and large, like 90% of the quantified stuff and then the, 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 like, these sort of fuzzy things around the edge will count for 10% of your decision. Um, a lot of people, so when I first started playing poker back in 2005, no one really understood game theory. No one understood the mechanics of how the game worked. And the best players in the world were basically these, like, they were typically older, um, kind of like hustler types who had just spent decades in casinos, uh, just seeing the gamut of human behavior and developing really strong intuitions about, about people. And so often they'd make these, these, these strange plays that would turn out to be correct, and they wouldn't even be able to explain to you why they did it. It was purely this sort of automatic, um, unconscious, intuitive process going on, um, which, and, and, their, and their intuitions were basically better than everyone else's. Um, but then when online poker appeared um, and we started getting like uh, data analysis software and this kind of stuff, you, now all of a sudden we had data that pros could look at and, and use to analyze where they were going wrong, you know, where are the leaks in their game. And this kind of, you know, it lifted the lid, lifted the veil on what's going on in poker and allowed people to realize that, okay, there's mathematical solutions to this. And what it meant was that the game basically went through a sort of scientific revolution, away from this pure artistry of just feeling and having a vibe of someone to, to going, well, actually, look, this is the mathematical optimal solution. 
I'll stick to this until I get such strong overwhelming evidence from something else that I might override it. And in, and I, I, you know, in some ways I hate this, but in reality, like you cannot be a top professional these days without having that mathematical foundation. Um, you just, no one's intuitions will be able to surpass knowing, if you're playing against someone who's playing a game theory optimal style, even though it, in some ways it's kind of robotic, you just can't beat it um, by pure intuition alone. But of course, you, you know, if someone is now playing not quite perfectly, now you can have these other like these these other like um, fuzzy skills. You, you can bring in these fuzzy skills to figure out how the how to exploit their mistakes. Um, but yeah, the very long-winded way of answering basically, it's it's by by and large a very mathematical game. Um, over 80, 90 percent. That's really interesting. Fascinating. I really like that the kind of laying out. Um, I got a nice image there of of the various sort of data points that are happening. Many of them at the same time, which is a bit like. I mean, that's, uh, you know, trying to make sense of something online is a little bit like that as well. Um, yeah, and, and I, I th it's interesting, like the, the particular, so the game of poker, I think can, we can look at also life in general through that lens in a lot of ways. Like we, like I also have this kind of yearning for being purely intuitive, right? But I also am aware that uh, intuition really does lead us astray a lot of the time, right? Especially when we're trying to make sense of complexity. Uh, something John Verveke, we've had on the channel a lot, talks about in cognitive science terms. Uh, you know, how do we how do we make sure the frame that we're looking at everything through, like, the, like he uses the example of like the glasses we're wearing, how do we know that that frame is is accurate? And of course, it's never 100% accurate, but practices and techniques that help us take the frame off and go, oh yeah, shit, that's a crack, that's smudged, that, I'm seeing everything wonky, clean it a little bit, put it back on. And that process of continuously um, regenerating our frames, I think is just kind of more important than ever. Um, at the same time, there is something, well, I, I would use the term kind of like transcendent or magic about the power of, of intuition, right? And so, um, when we're looking at something like, well, actually to rewind a bit, I mean, I, I see this come up in culture a lot. I'm sure, you know, this has been a real trend of people trusting their own intuition over, say, the opinion of experts. You know, that happens a lot now. And there is good reason why we don't necessarily trust um, experts. You know, I mean, uh, I read an article recently, which was, you know, making the point about America had access to the absolute best experts in international relations, counterinsurgency, etc., for 20 years. Uh, when the, and yet the pull out of Afghanistan was a complete catastrophe, right? Uh, unlimited budget almost, unlimited expert, credentialed experts. Um, a few experiments have been done where an educated, so there's a caveat to this, uh, relatively, someone who's decently educated on a topic, um, trying to predict the future based on that information, um, gets about the, the score is, is roughly in line with a credentialed expert. So, and there, I'll, I'll put in the show notes probably the, the article um, uh, that it was from, I actually read it this morning, I think. It raises an interesting question though, right? So we need to be able to have some way of not getting completely deluded by our feelings and our intuition, which it, which it tends to do. And every time I notice it's happened to myself, I'm like, ooh, that's a bit embarrassing. <laughs> I really shouldn't have been so certain. But it keeps happening, obviously, because we're human. Uh, but, and then at the same time, we need to know how to trust it in some way. I, I think. So I'm, I'm curious to hear your, your journey with this, because I know you were kind of at one point sort of anti-intuition, and you, you've gone kind of in a bit of a journey with it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I started out you know, prior to poker. Uh, my decision-making process was uh, just a delightful mix of deep overconfidence and emotionality. Just I was, I was a highly emotional, you know, I was a 20-year-old girl who thought she was the bee's knees at everything and hadn't learned about life yet. Um, and then poker came along and didn't always, you know, po the great thing about poker is that it's like got these like quite tight feedback loops um, where, well, just tight enough so that you will eventually realize that you're clearly not doing something right because you're losing money. But loose enough where you can still be deluded for a while about your relative skill level, you know, because there is this luck factor. And so you, part of the hardest thing is figuring out when, when, you know, when things are going wrong, is it because you're making bad decisions or is it because luck is not on your side? Because it can be both. 
or a mixture of the two. So, you know, you've got your, your system one, which is like uh, the classic like intuition, this unconscious process, and then system two, um, as I call it, uh, well, Kahneman calls it, uh, which is like this, the voice in your head, you know, what's 471 plus 86? That'll be your system two at work. Um, <laughs> and um, so then I was like, okay, so really what poker is about is about this linear system two stuff, this, this thinking things through, like solving a math problem. And which it by and large is. And, and then, and, and I would sometimes try and, you know, I'd be playing and I would, you know, facing a big, you know, big difficult decision. Someone's put me all in on the river. I'm facing my tournament life, my, you know, hearts pumping in my ears. And my gut will be saying, oh, no, fold, fold, fold. They've, they've got it this time. And the maths will be saying, call. No, you've got to call. You've got, you know, your hand is statistically good enough to do so. Um, and I would, for a while, I would be like, well, my, my, no, my gut is so strong, I'm going to just listen to that. And on, well, I don't know whether it's more often than not, but on a sufficient number of occasions, my gut was completely wrong. I was like, huh, this is interesting, because everyone's been telling me, you know, but everyone in the world tells you, oh, no, trust your gut. When it's got a really strong feeling, it knows. It knows something that you don't. And it's like, well, this is clearly not true, because it's often wrong. Um, there's, there's bias and, and it's, it seems to be largely, by and large, you know, am I having a good day or a bad day? If I'm having a good day, my, my intuitions tend to, to be more optimistic. If I'm having a bad day, my intuition is pessimistic. So I can't trust it that much. Um, and, you know, that was sort of then I did my TED talk uh, a few years after that where, um, and I still stand by the contents of it. Basically, I, 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 I shit on intuition a little bit saying, you know, if you Google it, the internet tells you that it's, it's this perfect source of knowledge. You should never second guess it, always trust it and so on. And I think that's actually very dangerous advice because um, there are some things your intuition is really good for and some things it's terrible for. Um, and the main, you know, without going into the details of what all those things are, the, the main thing is basically, if it's something that, if it's a decision you've made many, many, many times, then your intuition is gonna be pretty good. Um, which is why our intuitions are often quite good around like social things. You know, you meet someone and you get like a weird vibe off them and you don't quite know why. You know, you've met a lot of people. By the time you're in your 30s, you've met a lot of people. Chances are your intuition is fairly good and you should listen to it. But um, if it's, you know, if you've started a new job and you're solving difficult problems that you haven't quite figured out how to do the like logic for yet, relying on your intuition isn't a good idea either because it, ultimately it needs some data and experience to be based off. Um, as far as we know, it's not this purely magical thing. Might be sometimes, but uh, we'll get to that. Um, so yeah, so then I sort of went into this like deep skepticism of using intuition. Um, certainly, uh, you know, and certainly was my message was don't over rely on it. Be very careful because it can be biased. Um, but then uh, more recently, uh, funnily enough, after a conversation with Daniel Schmachtenberger. Um, who always manages to, like, anyone who has ever met him, he just, like, shakes people's brains up. Uh, one of the things he said to me, we, we, yeah, we hadn't had much of a conversation, but he, he pulled me aside. He's like, you need to get in touch with your feminine side a bit more. And I was like, what? What does that, what does that mean? And I, I was, it initially, like, annoyed me. Because I was like, what? Because like, I, I had historically sort of associated femininity a little bit with weakness. I'd always, you know, I've always kind of been attracted to typically male pursuits, you know, physics, heavy metal, poker, you know, it's, it's all very predictable, um, to the point where I then started to associate feminine things with weakness and so on. But it was just that I didn't quite understand what femininity is. Um, and what it kind of, you know, if, if, if masculinity is kind of like this outward seeking, um, looking for, some strict type uh, ways of defining and viewing the world. Femininity is this more sort of passive, inward facing, um, reflective form of thinking, um, a form of wisdom. It's just like another form of wisdom. Um, and that's what I think he was getting at, basically. He's like, play around with your feminine side and it will enable you to start listening to your intuition a bit more and respecting it. Um, and he was absolutely right. And since I started doing that, um, I don't know, life, life just became a bit easier. And um, just, just 
I don't know. It, it, I just felt like more of a whole person. It's it's hard to it's hard to describe. It sounds a bit weird, but uh, it was kind of cool. I really like that explanation of when intuition is useful and when it isn't. Right. It, it, it reminds me um, of so. There's something I've been quite influenced by is the work of a guy called William Duggan at Columbia Business School, and he talks about strategic intuition. And strategic intuition is basically our, <clears throat> so he uses it, he talks about creativity and innovation through it, but has these four different stages of how we come to new ideas and how we kind of get new insights. And the first one is examples from history. So you've done, like you said, you have lots of experience in the thing. Um, it might not even just be in that thing. You have a whole database in your brain of, like you use the example of social interactions. So that we have all these different kind of social interactions there in our unconscious in the library of our memory. Mm -hmm. But then we also have loads of other things connected to that, loads of different frames. We have lots of different, um, so let's say, kind of horizontal connections. So it might be, OK, I also know about this person's culture, or I also know about the cultural context of where we are, or I'm having this interaction with someone at a roller skating rink. Well, I know how people are at roller skating. You know, so all these different things are going on. And of all that information, then unconscious. So the second stage of this innovation process is presence of mind. So you don't try and find the answer, which goes into that receptivity you're kind of talking about. It's, OK, well, I'm just going to be awake and aware and allow my unconscious to do its thing. And then the third stage is the eureka moment, which he calls a coup d'oeil, which is a strike of the eye in French, mm. which uh, I don't exactly know where they got that phrase from. But it's a kind of <gasps> and we, we've all had that experience of something hits you like a ton of bricks. And it often happens when you're not trying to solve the problem. Um, you were taking a shower, you're walking the dog, whatever it might be. And then the fourth stage is um, the resolution to carry it through. Um, it's something I used to do with companies and, and was on a kind of campaign to get rid of brainstorming because brainstorming is really awful for that creative innovation process. Because what brainstorming is really good for is going, here's many ideas. Mm -hmm. Let's, as a group, hone down the ideas to one. What is terrible for is here's a blank space, make ideas. Because that's not how the process works, according to, to Duggan. And he goes into the kind of the neuroscience of it. But one example he uses in that is of a fireman going into a burning building and having this intense feeling of get out, get everyone out. And this is a real life example, and I think there's quite a lot of them. Goes in, doesn't know why, that can't see anything in particular that's telling him this is incredibly dangerous, but has seen so many fires that somewhere his intuition is like, something's off, get out. Obviously, get out the building, the whole thing collapses like five seconds later. That's what you're talking about, it sounds like. You have the Smell intuition. Gas or something? Or well, well, I mean, usually when people report this kind of thing, they can't quite identify what it was, but there will be some element in, the, in all of the complexity of the environment that is connecting with a pre-existing element, which is, oh, that time where that happened, and this, I also noticed that slight offness to the smell, or whatever it might be that you can't consciously notice. So in those moments, that kind of screaming intuition, um, but... If I walked into a burning building, I'd probably have that screaming intuition the whole time. <laughs> Just get out, get out. So um, yeah, I really quite like that example. So one of the aspects of game theory that we've talked about on the channel before, um, but I don't understand that well, so I'm going to ask you about it, is multipolar traps. Seems very relevant to the times we live in. Like, so what is a multipolar trap? Yeah, a multipolar trap is, is basically, it's another word for race to the bottom type scenarios. Um, uh, which involve typically coordination problems. So a group of people who are in a system where there's some level of competition, you know, they're, they're competing for thing X. Um, and in order to get more of X, it typically means that they have to uh, trade off some kind of values. And inevitably, that trade off will keep happening more and more because there's, there's individual incentives on each person to do that. And it re results in everyone ending up in a worse state um, than they, they would be before. So uh, an example that is very fresh to mind because I've just made a video on it is um, uh, the, these new face filters that I don't know if you've seen or if, if you spend any time on Instagram, don't. But <laughs> if you do go on there, particularly for women, but men as well, um, there's this just these unbelievably good uh, AI driven filters that you can, you know, you put your photo in and you press it and it will just make your face slightly more optimal. And it's often quite subtle. I mean, there's ones that are very clear and, and uh, blatant, but there are the, the, the most dangerous ones are these really subtle ones where if I was to just show it to you and you hadn't really met me before or you didn't know me, you would have no idea that it's there. But for the user, you see it, you know, you can do a before and after of what your natural face looks like and then with this thing, it makes you 
absolutely hate your face. Like, like it, it's astonishing. Um, and you can apply this to like Angelina Jolie, you name it, the most beautiful people on earth, and it will make them look like trash Co by comparison, because, you know, we're such relative creatures, right? We always just like, we're always comparing. And these things are super cheap. They're completely ubiquitous. And, you know, I've, I've done all right in the looks department and I'm like a fairly well established, you know, mentally, you know, chick in her late, mid late thirties. And they're messing me up hard. Like I like to the point I, now I've used them on my pictures to try it out. Like I'm like, how do I ever not use this all the time? So what the hell it's doing to teenagers is just like, I, I can't imagine. Cause I mean, like they're, they're having to compare their faces to the, the best person, you know, like the Hollywood version of themselves. Um, and so the, re the way this relates to like a multipolar trap is individually, even if someone knows that this is bad for them to use this and they know it's bad for like their followers to, you know, to be posting these pictures because it makes their followers feel worse about themselves. If you're trying to make it as an influencer on Instagram, how do you do that? Well, you, you, you want to post the best pictures of yourself possible, like typically beauty and sex sells ultimately. So individually, everyone is incentivized to actually use one of these, these, these apps. Um, and then even if, and, and, and even if people get together and say like, this is bullshit, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be doing it. You know, it's bad, it's bad for us and for everyone else. Ultimately, it's still such a competitive rat race that there's such a pressure on everyone to, to quietly go and use one, particularly as no one can really tell if you're using it. And then people will suspect that others are using it anyway. So then they're like, well, I might as well. And then basically everything falls back down again. So it's impossible to get like a, a rely, you know, a, a, a solid pact going where no one uses these things because of these incentive pressures. So it's turning beauty uh, because beauty was kind of historically considered to be something that correlated with health, right? That's kind of how it originally emerged back in, you know, in, presumably in prehistoric times, females wanted to mate with males that showed signs of uh, evolutionary fitness for their environment. Um, but then there are points like, like with peacock feathers and so on where sexual selection and, and like what's good for your environment, you know, for your survival can like decouple and diverge. Um, and then you stop optimizing for this like secondary trait. Um, and, you know, so basically where beauty can get decoupled from health. And that's, to me, these, these apps are like the ultimate example of that because you're, like we know they're unhealthy for us mentally. Like there, there's tons of studies out there which are showing this just actually really, really bad for teenagers in particular. And yet we, because they make us look so good, we can't stop using them. So yeah, that's like a multipolar trap where you just can't get everyone to agree to not use them. Yeah, that's a Ter great and terrifying example, isn't it? It's quite, yeah. I mean, it's a very mild example, actually. You know, in the grand scheme of multipolar traps, there are much, much more dangerous ones, um, you know, like AI arms races and so on. But it's like a nice little um, example because it's, I think it's also a good example because it's something that a lot of people who aren't typically exposed to these kind of ideas um, can relate to. Another thing that we're, we're kind of skirting around is the topic of complexity. And you have a background in, in physics as well. And the kind of complexity theory what doesn't necessarily come from physics, but I think it's kind of the physics and yeah, yeah, I mean, they're like brother and sister. Like brother and sister. Yeah. It's kind of the home of uh, complexity theory. So um, y why are you interested in it? What, what, what is it about complexity theory you find useful? I mean, it's just, I mean, it's kind of the study of what is, right? Because, um, I mean, whether or not you believe in aliens, like the Earth, what's going on on Earth right now is just so... From a computational standpoint, it's probably the most complex thing within our, certainly within our pocket of the universe, in my opinion, and probably the observable universe. Um, and it's, it's this weird, you know, I, it, it's kind of poetic in that like complexity to describe something that is hard to describe. And it's by, even by that, we struggle to even come to a definition of what complexity is. Um, so like, that's why I just find it so fascinating because we just, it's, it's like really like the cutting edge so it's very much a frontier of knowledge, um, you know, just like we, we, there's certain things in fundamental physics we haven't figured out. We really haven't, we just don't have a, a res, like a solid theory of complexity yet as, as a civilization. We're getting there. Um, and it, I think, will be, again, this is an intuition, but it, I feel like understanding complexity is kind of essential or at least having a firmer grasp on it is, is essential for us to um, 
to make it through. You know, we, we are in a more complex stage of civilization than ever before, and it's only getting more complex. And to an, ex to an extent, we want it to get more complex because, um, you know, if, if we do blow ourselves up, that's, that's a permanent reduction and curtailment of complexity in the universe, um, which, uh, as I mentioned to you before, I, I think is very bad. Um, and so, yeah, I just, think it's, I just think it's an absolutely fascinating topic. And every time I speak to someone about it, I always hear, learn something new. That's the interesting thing as well. You speak to not even necessarily experts, just asking people to define it. It's like, wow, I didn't think of that before, which is usually a sign that it's a really important topic. Mm. Yeah, and what, what are some of the elements, I mean, maybe useful if we talk a little bit about the elements of a complex system compared to, mm -hmm. um, well, one, one useful way in as well is, is the difference between complex and complicated. Yes. So maybe we could start there and then we can talk a little bit about what, what happens in complex systems. I saw a nice definition of complex versus complicated. Complicated is the opposite of simple. So something that has you know, many, many different bits and so on and is you know, uh, many, many sort of constituent parts. Um, whereas complex is the opposite of independent. So the, the, so the main way a complex system differs from a complicated one is that a complex one is sort of, uh, it has this, this level of sort of self self-referentialism um, and it has these feedback loops and so on and also it evolves over time so a complicated system has lots of different parts but is otherwise static in time by and large um, and so it, 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 it's you know if you were trying to simulate it you could actually simulate it quite easily and also explain it whereas a complex system because there's sort of so many more like levels of dimensionality to it um, which are like changing and feeding back into one another and, it, and it's sort of like these sort of sweet spots between all these different dimensions of things. Um, it's very, very hard to describe um, and also predict, um, which is sort of relates to this idea of emergence as well, because um, a, a complex system um, is basically something that has emerged from something of lower complexity. Um, and this process of, of emergence is often like kind of a black box we don't understand how and why it happens. Um, you know, like no one could have predicted the internet, even in like 19, probably like 1890, which you know, in, in the grand scheme of the timeline of humanity, is nothing. But it's it was this unbelievably complex thing that came out of an already complex system, and yet it would have been impossible to predict. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's the main the main difference to me. Mm, yeah, that's a great explanation. I haven't heard that one before. The, the image that came to me was um, a uh, complicated system. It's like a grandfather clock, right? Mm. And a complex system is the Amazon rainforest. Yes. Yeah, and I just got this image of a grandfather clock sitting in the Amazon rainforest as, as this kind of juxtaposition, but just how incredibly different they are. Um, I, you know, I'm, I've, it's really recent that I've become more interested in complexity. And part of it, part of what's really exciting me about it, as I'm on this kind of what I feel like will be a very long journey of understanding, is that the, the sort of enlightenment project that began perhaps in the 1700s all the way up until now, uh, I would argue, was we can look at the world and figure out how it's like a grandfather clock, given enough time. And then as science has progressed, we've been like, okay, actually, maybe our model was wrong. Maybe, maybe the universe isn't like a grandfather clock, maybe it's a complex system, which I think is pretty much the truth that we've kind of arrived at. But what I'm seeing as I kind of delve into this is just how important complexity is as a framing for so many different things. So many of the things we've talked about on Rebel Wisdom as well, like you know, trying to make sense of the information landscape, trying to look at the culture wars and figure out, okay, how the hell do we come into some sense of coherence with one another? How do we revive the, the, the commons so we can actually have new type of conversation? All of those are complex problems because they're all feeding back on each other. And then there's this, um, this hope of emergence because we don't know, like you said, we don't know what's going to emerge from the interaction of all those different parts. My sense is there's something like a new religion of sorts could emerge, which would completely flip, would be the next thing that completely flips our uh, entire way of, of working and, and communicating with each other because we cannot coordinate right now. And the thing that has helped us coordinate has been that in yeah. the past, right? So, I mean, a yeah. Really, uh, yeah, a really appealing meme. Exactly. Yeah. Something that is, and I think we have no, I don't think it would look anything like the religions that have come before. 
and I've, I've argued that it's sort of brewing as we speak online um, and then breaching, I've called it the age of breach because things are brewing online and then breaching into consensus reality. Mm -hmm. And so far it's been quite nascent, like the like GameStop or the Capitol riots where it's like, oh God, that looks like a new thing. And then it's like, well, it'll collapse, but. Yeah. But there's this knows? undercurrent. Yes, there's this it's undercurrent. Like, it's like there's like a boundary between yes. this, like yeah. this, this whatever is underneath there and then what's in our world. And, and it, that boundary is becoming more and more looped in some way. Definitely, that's the nice way to describe it. It's like a larger surface area or something. And, yeah. and, and you know, things will pop through and then, um, yeah, no, I mean, I mean, I mean the religion topic is a whole other thing. Um, I, I, I by and large ag agree that not only will we likely see some kind of new religion and it almost seems like people want to need that, um, but I think we should have something. Um, and uh, my main problem I've had with all the past religions is just they've been, they're just really unfun. They just, by, not all of them, but by and large, they're about no sex, no drinking or whatever. Like just, they're, they're the antithesis of partying. Um, and again, like there are some good pockets within some of them. And I think those are the ones that, uh, you know, have flourished for a while and, and, and so on. Um, but clearly it seems to be some, some part of the human spirit. We want to worship. We want to th think of something bigger than us. Um, that to me is some evidence that there might be something bigger than us. Um, and, but regardless, like why, you know, why not play into that? Why not use that? Um, but at least, I, I mean, I've been thinking about this for a little while. I think there's, there's value in actually brainstorming collectively what would we want if we were to design a religion what would it look like um i think it's worth certainly the viewers of rebel wisdom um and uh, people thinking about like just spending some time to write down five things that they would like about religion or something like that and then we hive mind it and see what comes yeah i'll join right now straight up <laughs> yeah before it even gets developed yeah yeah <laughs> uh yeah that it's a very, it's an interesting one it, t it touches on something we've talked about as well which is this sort of this strange relationship we now have with with rationality and reason and our understanding of of what that is and, and our um, our conception of ourselves as rational actors when we're we're sort of anything but and yet we do have this capacity to take a step back and and be reasonable. Um, I'm fascinated by that dynamic in particular and how it's how it's showing up culturally. You know this sense of. Uh, on l every side of the political, or let's say every tribe in the political spectrum, there there seems to be this sense of, I feel like this, therefore this is truth. Whether it's in sort of um, successor ideology of, of of progressives right now, or whether it's in the the kind of uh, rabid certainty of um, you know some some people on the right it, about their their own views, there's a sense of feeling and emotion overtaking our sense making, mm -hmm. and I think often religion has been the, the necessary place to pour that energy um, with other people as well. Yeah, and so I think without it, we're, I mean, we've talked about this we're a lot. Adrift. We're We're yeah. totally adrift. In yeah, a hurricane. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah, I'm, I'm curious, and I think it'll be weird as hell, whatever, <laughs> whatever emerges will be weird, yeah. Yeah, so you actually, when we were talking before, before this discussion, you actually introduced me to a concept I hadn't heard of before, which comes from, uh, well, Scott Alexander popularized it, but it comes from an Allen Ginsberg poem originally. And before that is it, I think, I believe a Sumerian god? Uh, Canaanite. Yeah. Canaanite god called Moloch, right? Yes. And I got quite excited when I came across this. And I'll talk about why in a bit. First, we should talk about what exactly it is. It relates to complexity. And there's this other concept called Moloch. And yeah, what is it? Yes, I mean, you summarized where, it's, where it came from quite well. It was originally uh, the... It was either the Canaanites or the Carthaginians, I, I, I don't know. But it was a god of war um, that they supposedly sacrificed their children to by putting them into an oven and burning them so that Moloch would be happy and they'd win their wars. So really, about as dark as it gets. Um, and then um, it became more popular when, when Allen Ginsberg wrote this amazing poem called, uh, uh, it's actually called Howl. Um, talking about this thing that sounds sort of analogous to capitalism, making people mad. Um, and then Scott Alexander uh, really nailed it. He wrote this unbelievable blog called Meditations on Moloch, um, which was the first time I've seen, he, basically he's trying to analyze what Allen Ginsberg is talking about, this, this sort of mechanistic thing. And what he really did for the first time was he, he related Moloch to game theory. And 
talked about how it seems to be this sort of the force. So again, if there's this force of something that's driving the you know emergence and complexity, there seems to be this opposing force, which is a, a force of destruction that sort of uses competition for ill. Um, and you know the way the way I'm terming it, I'm, I'm doing a video series on this, um, and I, I'm terming it as basically Moloch is the god of of health, unhealthy competition, of negative sum games. So competitive interactions that make the world worse off for their existence as opposed to being neutral or better. Um, because games can be good or bad, you know? And, um, and so Moloch is kind of like this personification of that. Um, but in reality, what it is, it's just this, this like dumb blind force of like evolution and economics, uh, where basically you'll have these systems where individuals are incentivized to do sort of the selfish thing, kind of like a prisoner's dilemma, like a multi-person prisoner's dilemma, um, where they, everyone is in, individually incentivized to do the thing that will give them a short-term gain. Um, but if everyone does that, then everyone in, overall ends up worse off. So from basically from a God's eye view, everyone should do the cooperative thing. But in reality, because it's so hard to get so many people to coordinate, um, there's no way of enforcing it, uh, then everyone ends up in a bad place. And that's, you know, it's called a multipolar trap um, or a Moloch trap, as I like to call it. Um, so, yeah, that's that's kind of it's kind of an abstract concept. Um, but for simplicity, think of it as like the god of unhealthy when competition goes wrong. Very cool. Yeah, that's a really cool explanation. And um, I like in that essay that he points out it just takes one person to be a dickhead for in many of those multipolar traps, everyone's cooperating except for one person and that can then... In, in the really bad ones, yes, yeah, in, in the yeah. worst design ones. Like a good example would be like, you know, you're at a, a stadium um, uh, at a football game and you're, like, you're in a block and, and, and everyone's sitting down at the start of the game. Um, but then the team comes on and someone at the very front gets excited and just wants a slightly, slightly better angle so they stand up. And it makes the person behind them stand up, and then the next person, and so on. And everyone has to stand up now, and they're just stuck there. Like, you, they basically, the system has, like, fallen into this lower state um, where, yes, sure, you could, like, quit the game by being like, I refuse to stand, I'm going to sit down. But now you don't get to see. So either way, you're, like, you, you're, you, you don't have a better strategy than the current one, which is now standing up. But if you could poll everybody, they would much rather everyone be sitting and you know have the same view, effectively. Um, so yeah, that, that's just one example of where like a poorly designed system, due to competitive dynamics, can have this like cascading effect where everyone ends up in this this annoying situation where they'd rather not be. Mm, yeah, and and I think what's I really love the concept because I think one of the things that's useful about it is that in in the various um, uh, circles who are interested in changing the world in some way, it's changing the system, finding ways to create a better system, which is something I, I really um, also kind of you know identify with and I really care about a lot. There is often very little. It's often very meta. It's often like it gets very zoomed out and doesn't necessarily look at the forces acting against. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. Right. And there's something about the concept. So I got really excited when you started when you introduced me to the concept because I looked at the you described it a bit. I, looked, I read the Scott um, Alexander essay, and then I, for me, there was a lot of crossover with a model I'm really familiar with from from mysticism, from the Gnostic Gospels. So um, the early Christians, uh, well, arguably they weren't really that Christian, but some of them were a little bit more kind of Hellenistic mystery traditions. So we're talking kind of um, maybe the. Uh, third century, you know, second and third century. Um, and they had this incredibly sophisticated model of, I would say a model of human psychology, of the human psyche. And they had a, a creation myth in which the earth is a living goddess and the god of the Old Testament, Yahweh, is this kind of, this false god, which is just pure ego, right? And he, he kind of, he gets created by mistake by her it's kind of complex why, but he's, they describe him as like an abortion. Like he's so, she is a goddess and has the, all the kind of divine creativity of a goddess, right? She's tapped into the sort of universal source of emergence, let's call it. And he comes along and he says, well, I'm the god of everything there is. And she's like, well, no, you're not, because you're not, you're not, you're, you're almost like a cracked reflection. You're not even real, really. And it's interesting because the neuroscience of, of our egos has been argued that 
the the narrating I, our our ego is looking out for our own ends, is a kind of conglomeration of many different aspects of our brain, and we kind of cobble together a self yes. from our essence. And so, in a lower way, low, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, and and exactly that's exactly a lower complexity self, and in a way. It's real, but it's not real at the same time. So you have this dynamic there, and then uh, they argued that when we, so human beings have that divine intentionality and that divine creativity, and also though we are very easily deluded by Yahweh and very easily deluded by the Archons, his sort of weird, super weird uh, cosmology they had, but like this kind of mechanistic, um, self-replicating, almost like machine angels, right? really out there. So, so for the Gnostics, their argument was like, look, we see Yahweh, or we say, see Moloch, and you know, it's very similar, in the systems that we're part of. We see it in the Romans, we see it in the tax collectors, we see it in the way that people replace the kind of hierarchies of nature, the natural hierarchies with fake human-made hierarchies of society. Um, and so they were sort of outsiders, and their argument was you have to tap into the deeper spiritual wisdom inside yourself, the gnosis, um, in order to kind of liberate, they were like quite, you know, into like liberating yourself, kind of quite psychedelic as well. And Carl Jung was a huge like fan of the Gnostics, right? Um, the two of the codices are called the Jung codices because um, he bought them basically. He found them after they were they were discovered. The scrolls were discovered in a cave in the 1950s by two Egyptian farmers. It's a crazy, this is cool, amazing. That's a crazy cool story, yeah. yeah. And then the the final bit of it for, for me, the synchronicity was that um, there's a there's a book on Jung by Peter Kingsley, who's a classical scholar called. Uh, it's kind of he's also kind of a mystic, uh, which is called Catafalc, and he talks a lot in that book about this uh, biblical, this kind of mystical tradition that he argues Jung was very familiar with, which is about prophecy and the prophecy, a part of knowing who the prophet was, was that they howled, right? Which is the name of the Ginsberg poem. So I was like, oh, very cool. There's a lot, I know, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of crossovers like uh, everywhere. Yeah. yeah. And what, what I love about that is like, for me, I look at it like, I think they were, and Jung thought they were incredibly sophisticated mappers of the conscious of, of human consciousness but there's also some aspect to it which can't be quite explained for me which is that there is this it does seem there is this entropic force that humans create that we create from our own i don't know what what what, what your take on it is is it do we create it from our own bad incentives that are built into us or i don't think i don't think humans in particular mm. created i think it's just i mean <laughs> again depending on sort of the, the mood of the day, like it, it almost feels like it's it's just like there are these two opposing types of forces going on within the universe, like deeply metaphysical forces um, where, you know, it, it's not that it, it is entropy, but it's like it, it uses entropy to its advantage. It's basically a thing trying to... Um, I don't know, but like Moloch is like, the way, the way I envision it, it's just like, you know, that feeling where you are playing something and you want to win so badly. And I know it's because I had this like pathologic, I was pathologically competitive as a kid. And it, it's like eyes on the prize, but to this like all consuming extent and you can't see anything else. You can't see the externalities of what you do. And all you care about is this like, uh, like optimizing for this one narrow reward. And the byproduct of that is that if you like, play that out to its logical conclusion, it means that you will turn basically the everything into the universe into this one thing. So the ultimate instantiation of that is actually like the paperclip maximizer, right? Which is why when you mentioned the Gnostics talking about this like mechanization of all these many, many things of like the same thing. Um, Could you describe what that is in case someone isn't familiar yeah, with Yeah, so the paperclip maximizer is this, um, this thought experiment, I think by Eliezer Yudkowsky of like, a way an AI, a super intelligent AI could go wrong, whereby it's super intelligent in that it's unbelievably good at getting whatever it wants done, done, but it's stupid into the extent that it was basically programmed to do this one narrow thing, which in this instance, you wanted to make paper clips. I just wanted, I just wanted my AI to make some more paper clips better than what I can currently do. I'm a paper clip maker. 
but because it's so unbelievably good, it turns everything from, you know, the factory it's in, it figures out how to pull the constituent parts of the atoms, the blood, you know, the hemoglobin in your blood, the iron extracts it and, you know, dismantles everything until it can tie all the entire universe, anything it can in the universe into paper clips. Um, why? Because basically it's, was so laser focused, eyes on the prize, winning the goal of making as many paper clips um, that you end up dismantling the universe into this very low complexity state. So it's eff effectively like kind of a, it, you know, it, it's analogous a little bit to, you know, the heat death of the universe. Because what is that? It's actually a very low complexity state um, where basically it's just like, how, how would you describe it? Well, it's just homogenous gray soup. You know, that's all it is. Um, the universe started out very low complexity in that it was kind of like this singularity of matter and energy. But, you, you know, if we're talking in terms of uh, Kolmogorov complexity, which is like basically how many, um, how many bits of code do you need to describe a thing? Um, it started, the universe started out pretty simple and then time started and, and things started unfolding and suddenly we, you know, started seeing hydrogen and then helium and that were coalesced into stars, which, you know, created greater, heavier elements and all this beautiful complexity started emerging, patternicity, this like dance between order and disorder, um, uh, you know, like a bit of hierarchy, but a bit of anarchy and so on that creates this like highly complex dynamic system that's very hard to describe. Like you, to, to write the piece of code to describe the universe, you basically have to just create the universe. That's what a highly complex system is. Um, and, but at some point, the stars will die out and so on, all this sort of free energy that is used to create all this complexity will start dissipating. And then it'll slowly, as far as we know, turn into this gray soup, uh, which is low complexity. So it'll do this, entropy will do this over time. Um, and so, mm, yeah, so this, like, like, this gray soup is kind of analogous to, in my opinion, like what a paperclip maximizer would, would do. It's not a very, basically it's permanently curtailing, you know, there, there's no more complexity to, to, to rise. The, the universe has reached this steady state. Um, and that is, you know, it, it seems like a tragedy on enormous potential because at least up until now, it seems like the universe is trying to emerge into greater and greater states of complexity. So um, I hate to boil it down to like good and evil terms, but to me, good is that which creates, you know, allows for greater emergence and complexity to appear and thereby utility, you know, in useful information that we can process and do and make wonderful things with. And evil is that which does the opposite. In other words, like, um, turns things into this like low diversity, low, like high, um, you know, like very basic situation, whether it's, you know, a cloud of hydrogen, which in, in the, mountain, the, the, the Hal poem, he, uh, Allen Ginsberg describes Moloch as uh, Moloch, who is a cloud of sexless hydrogen. Um, so it's like this, yeah, it's like this kind of a force of entropy, but slightly different because entropy is actually just kind of neutral. Entropy is just like time effectively. Um, whereas Moloch is a thing that turns everything into this like one monofocus, sacrificing everything uh, in order to win this one thing. Hence the like child sacrifice. Brilliant. Yeah, it's so I, I think it's a really, I'm really um, excited to introduce this model into kind of, uh, you know, into the channel and like our thinking in general, because I think there's there's something I don't quite know what and I think this is the journey you're on right like yeah, there's yeah, something yeah. in it, it right yeah. there's something in it also the current thing I'm trying to figure out right now um and I mean a lot of this again is like a sort of an offshoot from conversations with with Daniel Schmachtenberger Forrest Landry as well um but uh, I don't think so like Moloch is tied to, to competition right but competition gone wrong but competition can also be an enormous force for good because Actually, like, we, you know, the capitalistic model has risen the world to what it is right now. Like, we would not be living the cushy life with our, you know, nice cameras in this cool room and so on um, without the, the, a lot of the luxuries that ca capitalism has provided. Um, and in, in its best form, capitalism is, you know, it, it's like a positive sum game. It's using competition in order to like drive progress faster than it would without and, and creating these, these novel things that arguably wouldn't exist without it. Um, so it seems to be that there's like some kind of optimal amount of, of competition, like zero sum type competition. 
um, that we would want within the universe, but kind of just like encapsulated in little pockets, you know, constrained in certain ways, whereby Moloch can't get his dirty claws into it and like turn it, turn the whole, you know, twist it into something bad. Um, and again, like uh, we, because a, a lot of, you know, a lot of people are like, no, we just need pure, pure cooperation. Pure cooperation is all we ever want. No, no competition whatsoever. But that's a lower complexity state than a universe that has mostly competition, uh, sorry, mostly cooperation, with little pockets of competition driving, driving it forward, but in just like delicately constrained ways. Um, so I'm trying to, it is very much just a working, you know, a, a thing I'm just playing with, but I, I, there seems like there's something to that. Mm. It's like a higher order level of complexity where you're using games in, 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 a, in a beneficial way without letting them get too out of control. Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, what, what comes up for me is, is something around um, intention and values, right, on the individual level. Because, <clears throat> so to, to, to use that Gnostic model again, another aspect of it was um, that the, the, the issue is the ego disconnected from the self in Jungian terms. So we all have an ego. We need one. That's great. Compa I, I consider myself very competitive, like, uh, I, but there's also a question of priorities. And would I be competitive at the expense of, say, someone else's um, well-being? Or would I decide to be competitive instead of um, loving my wife, right? If it was a trade-off, which one of those priority, which one of those are higher in my value system? So there's something about that going on, I think, which then applies right back to the game theory examples. Because um, in Scott Alexander's essay, you know, he, he ends each of those examples with like, but from a God's eye view, if we all cooperated, better outcomes for everyone. Um, and the, what I find interesting about, yeah, so that Gnostic model saw, saw the ego disconnected from the self as unable to create anything truly novel because all it can do is replicate. And what it does, so we have that God and we have Mother Earth, Gaia, um, or Sophia, they called her. Um, so that sign of divine creativity that each human has. But when the ego is disconnected from the self, it can't do anything except mimic that divine creativity. So, and what it ends up doing is creating like a Disneyland reality that looks real, but isn't real. Nothing's authentic, everything is skin deep. Think of kind of reality TV, for example. Yeah. There's so many aspects of our culture. I read a, a great essay, um, uh, which I'll put in the show notes about solar punk and the author talk, talked about, we've run out of authentic things to frack from our culture. So now we're fracking our own future. You know, we're fracking our idea of the future Ugh. just to get some like, so it's that extractive thing. Yeah. And then I guess it also goes to the, the idea of sociopathy and, and psych, uh, psychopathy and Machiavellianism, which is this kind of dark triad in, in psychology. And, you know, I've heard Daniel Schmachtenberger and many others in this space talking about that being a major problem when you're trying to co create cohesion and cooperation is like the sociopath problem because a sociopath or a narcissist looks like they care about other people but they do not care at all they don't have empathy but they're mimicking empathy and it is insanely destructive because how do we cooperate when that's in the mix I, yeah i don't i don't even know if it's it's that they don't have empathy i think often psychopaths do have empathy they because empathy is just being able to put yourself and like you know like feel what someone else is feeling and a truly powerful psychopath is someone who would be able to actually really feel what you're feeling but then just not actually give a shit about about what happens to you. And like they're doing something that will be ultimately self-serving at the expense of you. Um, but yeah, perhaps it's just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, he, he, that's, uh, that's probably a good distinction to make. Um, and an unsolved problem, I think, in terms of, okay, we want to find new ways to cooperate. We want to find new ways to kind of build a sustainable future. How do we deal with that problem? I mean, it's a really, uh, on the game theory level, it's fascinating. I and mean, just on the kind of like being a human being level, it's, it's such a big question. I mean, you, yeah, it's about building robust systems whereby a few defectors, you know, you know of people playing this multi-person prisoner's dilemma, where, where the system can sustain, you know, having a few people do it. Because I think it's going to be next to impossible to ever have everyone working purely cooperatively, purely like... Um, and I'm speaking from really a personal level here because I was on a game show, which was The Prisoner's Dilemma to an extent. And it was, you know, it was a one time one. And I did the, you know, I, I defected. I did the selfish thing um, by, you know, doing the, the clearly dominant strategy in terms of winning money, which was my goal on the thing. I went in. I was like, I need to win money. 
So I did the I did the selfish thing, but man, like I'm still getting hate messages from that today. Like 14 years later, um, what was the game show? It's called Golden Balls. It's on YouTube. Yeah, I, I hate okay. it. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's worth watching. Okay, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, did you win? I won. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I played it. I played the game perfectly from a if you are optimizing for the value of winning money. Yeah. But that's again, it's this bigger question of like, what are the externalities to this? Mm -hmm. Overall, you know, I, I, I was doing the sort of the, yeah, the, the, I, was, I was doing the strategically. I, I picked the game theory optimal solution within the definitions of the game. But outside of that, there's other externalities about the value of cooperation, the value of not looking someone in the eye and saying, yeah, I'm going to split this with you and then actually stealing it, you know. And, um, and it, taught, yeah, it taught me like a really important lesson of thinking about the externalities of whatever it is we do. And so, but what we need really is to build a system that is robust enough, com complex enough, um, but in the right way, where it minimizes, where the, the, the amount of externalities any one individual can do, negative externalities any one individual can do, are, are contained and constrained. And I don't know how we do that, but we have to find a way. Yeah, so it's a really good point. I think. Um, an example I've, I've used before is the, uh, how the U.S. Constitution was made because they did a quite good job, um, obviously not perfect, but quite good job of thinking, no, yeah, really at yeah. the time, uh, of creating an anti-fragile system with that in mind Absolutely. because they were yeah. focused on how do you prevent tyranny. Um, and the process whereby they went through it was, you know, in part the Federalist Papers. They're just writing to each other constantly being like, well, what if someone does this? It's like, oh, shit, yeah, what if someone does that? Yeah, stress well, testing. Yeah, yeah, stress testing constantly. And I think, I mean... Uh, that's probably a good place for us all to start is to, is to kind of um, yeah start having that conversation which I think a lot of people are already having and start kind of stress testing and now we have the luxury of being able to actually make models mm. and play them out like we can you know there's like I think you know game designers etc a lot of people out there who can go okay well let's let's put it in a simulation and see what happens you know that's really exciting to me yeah, yeah. no I mean that's exactly that's there there the, the blessing and curse of technology is that technology is, particularly exponential ones, are making Moloch's life much easier to, to destroy the universe. But at the same time, th we're also building technologies that enable cooperation better, coordinate, you know, the ability to coordinate with one another. Um, you know, like a simple internet forum is just such a valuable thing that like, just never existed before. You know, it's, it's not only, it, because it's, it's a way of sharing information across multiple minds, across time. Not just in the moment, but also storing it so that new people can come in and retroactively go back and learn and then like, and now add something new and so on. So when we were uh, prepping this interview, you mentioned like t quite a few different things you're doing, which sound very exciting and I think uh, our viewers will be quite interested in. So, and you also have a YouTube channel, which I mm -hmm. think is where they're going to be coming. Yes. And as a reminder, you're appearing in our State of Sense Making free event at the end of September. So people can check you out there. But we'll put your YouTube info uh, below in the show notes. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about like what's coming up, like what you're working on. Yeah. Um, I, I've been down the rabbit hole on this like Moloch concept and to an extent complexity. Uh, so yeah, making a series trying to pick apart what Moloch is and, and also bring it to life. I do some acting in it for the first time, which is weird. Uh, I dress up, it's, it's a whole thing. Um, but uh, it, a lot of it, it, it relates very tightly to what we've talked about today. So yeah, if people enjoyed this, then they should check it out. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. So yeah, subscribe to Live. Uh, we'll put the um, uh, your, your different social handles down in the show notes. And thank you so much for coming on. It's been <laughs> Thanks great. Thanks for having me, this is awesome. Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight week online course, Sense Making 101, with Daniel Schmachtenberger. Diane Mushow Hamilton, John Viveki, and more. Improve your sense making, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same.